We'd ask that God would add his blessing to the reading and the proclamation of his word this day. You know, one of the first messages that we give our children in Sunday school, in church, or at home is this, God loves you. It's so important to us that our children and our young people, well, those of any age, those who are just coming to a knowledge of Christ and and those who've been Christians since birth, that all of us know that God loves us. And I think of this, I always remember being in Nairobi, Kenya with a folks at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, and the Kenyan people are filled with enthusiasm and the joy of the Lord in a very special way, and they love to sing and they love to dance, and, and they have a song that says, God loves you and I love you, and that's the way it should be, and it's very repetitive with a bunch of hallelujahs thrown in there every once in a while, and I think of God loving all of us, and I can, I can hear their voices, I can see them dancing with the, with the joy of that knowledge. God loves you, and that's the way it should be. God loves you is an idea that we know to be true, but I wonder how easy it is for us to make it our own. When my grandson Nate was born, and I bet you grandmothers and your moms and dads and grandpas can identify with this, that little newborn life in your hands, just bring him up to your to your mouth is whispered gently into his ear, God loves you, and so do I. And so he heard that over and over again, and I hope that he carries that with him every day of his life now. And then the same with Josh came along, second blessing, pull the baby up, God loves you, and so do I. It's a, it's a beautiful thing to be able to, to do and to share and to know the truth of that. We want our children to know and claim this truth. So we just can't seem to say it too much. I don't think that we ever get tired of it either. I know when I'm with someone who's sick or laid up from surgery, someone who's afraid or alone or just can't do the things that he or she always used to be able to do, sometimes in the conversation I'll just say gently, well, I just want to remind you that that God loves you. And I always get a smile in return. I'm not sure if they are claiming that message again anew, if we're being reminded of it, but God loves you. We can't hear it too often. We can't say it too often. But how do we claim it for ourselves individually? I mean, how comfortable are we uh, if we would just stand up and go, hey, listen to this. God loves me. Me. God loves me. That's a hard thing for us to do. Maybe we can internalize it better. Maybe we can review our lives. I know I can review my life. I can look back and I can see hundreds of times when God was there for me before I even asked him to be there for me without any knowledge that I was really at any risk. And I was out there walking on some tight wire in life and God was there because God loved me. It's not prompted by selfish ambition. God's love is true. God loves us. God will continue to love us. Not because we do everything right or anything right. Not because we fail to do bad things. But just because we are. Because we exist. Because God loves what he has created. God loved me and God loved you long before any of us had the opportunity to choose to love God. This notion of God's enduring and everlasting love, that's what invites us to step out of the darkness and step into the light of being in Christ's presence, into the kingdom of God and into everlasting life. Within today's reading, as Jenny read for us, is the Bible verse that most adults recognize as the first thing they ever memorized from the Bible, John 3, 16. Martin Luther called it the gospel in miniature. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his only begotten son, so that whoever believed in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. We teach it to our children so that they can begin to know and hold on to God's love. 
But as adults, as maturing Christians, we see so very much more in that verse and the verses that surround it. See, today's opening verse, as Jenny read, takes us to the Old Testament. It reminds us of this redemptive act of our Creator God began long, long before the actual birth of Jesus. In fact, some theologians would argue that God began the redemption in a perfect plan at the very moment of the fall. There are writings in the Old Testament that foreshadow the actions of the Messiah. They predict this arrival of the Redeemer. They parallel the words and the acts of Jesus. All these things are abundant throughout the Old Testament. Here in this reading today, we have a reference to Moses in the wilderness, a reference that asks us to look at the story in numbers and to refresh our understanding. See, at that time in the desert, the people were impatient again. So the Lord sent poisonous serpents among them. The serpents, of course, bit the people, and the people died. In response, the people panicked, and they asked Moses to do something about this, to pray to the Lord. That was Moses' decision, pray to the Lord. And the Lord responded to Moses' prayers. He told Moses to make a serpent and to put it above the people on a pole. And then whenever someone was bitten, they were to look at the serpent and they would live. This bronze serpent was lifted up as a means of healing. The people just needed to look at the serpent and they would live. John is saying in the scripture today that that serpent foreshadows Christ. As the serpent was lifted up, so was Jesus. He was lifted up to bear the sins of many. And all we have to do to find healing, to find life, is to look to Jesus Christ. Our eyes on Christ, who saves sinners from guilt and from the penalty and the power of sin. Christ lifted up before us. Now, obviously, it wasn't the serpent that saved the Israelites. It was God. And so it was the same for Christ with us. This is God at work through his only begotten son. This is his redemptive power. He's ready to save us if we will just look for Christ and keep our eyes on him. And so we know the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, will be lifted up on a cross and he will become a symbol of God's selfless and committed love. This was necessary so that we could be restored to right relationship with God. In spite of our sin, in spite of the behaviors which are abhorrent to God, in spite of the way we turned away from God's direction, and we've done it again and again. God sacrificed his only son in such a dramatic way so that we would know just how valuable each and every one of us is to God so that we would know the promise of eternal life was not just idle talk, so that we would realize what it means to be forgiven. Love and light and life came into the world in the person of Jesus Christ, God's Son. And God expects us to act on that arrival with belief, I have a very theologically liberal minister friend who once suggested in conversation with a group that there might be other ways to God besides Jesus. And I'm sorry to say that in many mainline Protestant churches, because we've become so careful about not offending anyone or are feeling as if we are judging or closing out anyone, that sometimes this need to believe is diluted in the messages. But Jesus says it to us plainly. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. No one comes to the Father except by me. And here we read it again in today's reading. In that very verse that we remember from being children, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. This isn't a casual imperative. This says it all quite clearly. It's this belief in Jesus that brings us into God's kingdom. 
It isn't really about being a nice person. That's good, too. It isn't really about serving humanity in amazing ways. That's good, too. It isn't even about working hard and being honest. It's about believing in Jesus. This is a scripture which is clear and central to our faith. We must believe. And from that belief, we receive a changed life, a life that reflects the lessons that Jesus taught with his own words and his own actions. It's a life that puts others first, that seeks to serve the least of these, our brothers and sisters. It is a life that's born again in Christ. Now, for those who consider that Christ's arrival was a condemnation and a judgment of the world, the verses continue to offer us assurance of God's pardon Jesus didn't come into the world to make us feel horrible about our sinful condition. Instead, he came to offer us salvation. And salvation, salvation is like a, bride, a broad, wide place where we can stretch our arms out, where we can physically turn around, turn away from the evils and the sin, and turn to Christ with our eyes on him. Jesus comes and he offers this to us, but we have to believe. So it isn't just that God is making a judgment. God is offering life. But God does ratify the judgment that's made by humans themselves when they choose not to believe. This is the depth and the measure of God's love and God's justice. This sacrifice of his only son that you and I could have a wondrous love. God is not sometimes loving and other times not. God is always love. The gift of Jesus is further demonstration that in everything God does, always, and in dealing with all people, God is love. This love is radically different from the love that we feel as humans for one another. There are some characteristics of God's love that would do wonders for the world, that would do wonders for the church, that would do wonders for our families if we could claim them as our own. Because God's love is universal, there is no discrimination, there is no limitation, there is no exclusiveness. God so loved the world God's love is unconditional. God doesn't ask us to prove that that we're worthy of this love. He doesn't demand that we first become law-abiding and respectable. God loves us first. And Christ was our model. I mean, look at the people that Jesus surrounded himself with, the people who were his friends and his disciples. There were dishonest people, the tax collectors. There were political revolutionaries, the religious zealots, There were the immoral, remember the woman caught in adultery, and there were the social outcasts, the Samaritans. God's love is without conditions, and it is an initiating love. That is to say that God doesn't wait for us to come and ask for love. God makes the first move, and time and again, he does that. Long before we seek and turn to God, God is already seeking us and turning to us. God's love is faithful. He never takes back the promise he made to love us. We can become faithless. We can walk away. We can turn our back. God will not. God may discipline us. God may judge us in our sinfulness, but God still loves us. It is everlasting. And God's love is reconciling. Jesus commanded us to love our enemies, not just our friends and family, not just those that we personally find commendable. God even loves those who've made themselves enemies of God by their sinful rebellion. God may confront their sinfulness, just as he confronts those who say they love him, but it is to restore, not to destroy. It's to heal rather than to hurt. It's to reclaim rather than to try to get even. 
You see, God loves to break down the walls that divide us with hostility. God's love is helping and it's renewing, it's forgiving and it's accepting and it will not leave us as we are. God's love takes the trouble to help us renounce and move out of our self-destructive rebellion. Now, God's love is not sentimental and permissive because God will not allow us to settle into our sinfulness, but urges us to learn to live in right relationship, to live new lives, to live born-again lives in Christ. You know, all we have to do is look at the cross. We just look at the cross and we're reminded of God's love. It was costly and it was self-giving. And God does not love us from a safe distance. He didn't look down on the world and say, hmm, they're suffering and I'm touched by it. Maybe I should send some kind of help. He didn't say, oh, perhaps I can put together a care package that might help this group or that group. And he didn't just say, oh, I think I'll just send them a new message. Maybe they'll get the message this time. No. In Christ Jesus, God comes to stand with us and to stand by us as one of us. In Christ, God was incarnated into the world. He was fully human, fully able to suffer as we suffer, to hunger, to thirst, to bleed, to die, just as we do. In Christ, God shared in all the hurt and all the anger of the world. God gave himself in his only son, and in that action, he sent into the world the ultimate source of light and life. Life, eternal in God's kingdom. Light, to shine against the darkness of evil and to show clearly the deeds done in God. Is this what you believe? That God's son came into the world because God loves you? Loves you enough to make a terrible sacrifice just to restore you to the salvation he promises. Perhaps you've grown up in a Christian home or you've been a Christian for so long that you haven't stopped and taken time recently to think, what is it that I believe? We've recently asked our young people in confirmation class to consider what they believe. They must each write their own personal statement of faith and then they will go and meet with our our elders, and they must be prepared to, to read that statement of faith, to own it, and to defend it. Might be a good activity for all of us. What is it that we believe? And what keeps you believing? What keeps you in that belief? A network of Christian relationships? Or is it just your own inner faith? And how effective, we ask ourselves, how effective is my faith when I step out of the safe surroundings of this church and into the world? Is it still strong? Is it still real when I'm out there? We have God's word for us every day. God's assurance of how much God loves the world. God's assurance of the promise of eternal life. God's guarantee of just who Jesus is. And all we have to do is believe. Our faith is a trust in God's love. And it becomes possible when we put ourselves in a situation to, to hear about and experience God's love over and over again. That's why you're here. It is unbelievably good news. God loves, forgives, accepts, in spite of all we've been and in spite of all we've done. And we just need to hear it again and again. And we learn of this steadfast love in our Bible studies and our Sunday schools. And we witness God's love when we gather here for, for baptism or communion. And we see God's love in the lives of those around us. We can find God's love is everywhere if we can first find it within ourselves and within our Christian fellowship. And we begin to experience God's trustworthy love when we stop trying to do everything on our own, when we trust God to guide us, to care for us, 
and when we become obedient. Trust God, listen to God, obey God, and believe. God brought light into the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Let us pray. Holy God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, may we indeed feel your love in a new way each day. And through the power of your Holy Spirit, may we find ourselves empowered to share that love with those that we meet. May the light and love of your Son, Jesus, be visible in our very lives. May we be the hands and feet that may share this love with those around us. And in all things, we bring you thanks and praise for the amazing love that is your Son. We pray in his name. Amen.